using. Oh, I did. I think oh, I did. Perfect. Did I? Yeah. Um, I have the extreme pleasure of introducing Dr. Stefan uh, Thibodeau, uh, who's been a resident in our program uh, for almost the last five years. Um, we're now down to uh, days uh, until his uh, graduation, despite him owing us uh, a couple uh, Foley catheter EPAs, I think. <laughs> there are some T-Mites as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Stefan's uh, been a, really a model resident in our program. Uh, he really embodies a lot of the uh, CanMed's roles uh, from professional scholar, manager, uh, collaborator, and, and communicator. Um, he's achieved a lot, uh, both uh, clinically, but um, uh, academically, uh, multiple first uh, author publications and publications in uh, prestigious uh, journals, including uh, JAMA uh, Oncology, uh, Journal of Brachytherapy, uh, and a few others. Uh, he's been nominated and won awards for the LEADS uh, uh, Certificate uh, in Toronto, uh, which is only awarded to a few residents in Canada per year, as well as the Aspire um, uh, Patient Safety uh, Course. So. Uh, he's done a lot in these uh, short five years, um, and we're very excited to have him speak to us about healthcare system factors in uh, stage three non-small cell lung cancer. So please give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Tony. So good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, as Martin said, my name is Stefan Thibodeau, PGY5 in radiation oncology. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to have been invited uh, to give Grand Rounds today. Uh, and so I'd like to start off by thanking the department for this opportunity. Um, as Martin mentioned, I'll be leaving next week. So this will be my final grand rounds at Queens before departing to start a career in Sault Ste. Marie in a few short weeks. I really must say that um, I don't count myself worthy to give such a presentation. Um, and so since this will be my last, I'll uh, thankfully be spared the distress of witnessing the grand rounds to follow. All kidding aside, my aim for today uh, is to share the results of my resident research uh, project, an analysis of healthcare system factors associated with receipt of treatment and with treatment intent in stage three non-small cell lung cancer in Ontario. This work required the constant support of my research mentors and colleagues at ICES and Cancer Care Epidemiology. So I'd like to begin first by acknowledging um, Dr. Tim Hanna, who is the principal investigator, uh, as well as Paul Nguyen, uh, Dr. Fabio Eno de Marias, Dr. Andrew Robinson, and Dr. Jason Pantorato. I'll begin with my disclosures, of which there are none. However, since, as I mentioned, I'm moving more than 10 hours away from Kingston in the coming weeks, I believe Mallory will be circulating a collection basket. So thank you in advance for your generous contributions. Uh, and for those online, you're not off the hook. My email address will be available at the end of the presentation. By the end of this presentation, uh, I hope that you will understand the characteristics of patients treated uh, in Ontario with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, understand the associations between patient and disease factors and receipt of treatment and its intent, understand associations between health system factors associated with receipt of treatment and treatment intent, and possibly explore opportunities to identify variations in treatment across Ontario. Most importantly, what I'd like to convince you of by the end of this presentation are really two things. The first is that there exists across LINs in Ontario, large variations in the propensity for offering curative intent treatment for patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, and that these variations are not solely explained by patient and disease specific factors, which one might consider typical or expected, such as age, comorbidity, or others. And these variations really are a cause for concern, both due to the possible issue of undertreatment, which is to say that there are some patients in some centers who may not have the opportunity to benefit from curative treatment. The other issue is overtreatment, such that patients may be selected for aggressive treatment for which they may derive little, if any, benefit or may only suffer harm. The research I'm going to present is based on the hypothesis that factors outside of a patient's control will impact the treatment that they receive. As someone from and destined to work in an underserviced and geographically dispersed region in Northern Ontario, a particularly notable factor like distance to cancer center, available expertise at the nearest cancer center are of special relevance to me. 
But the research is also based on the hypothesis that quality cancer care is optimal if the treatment received and the treatment intent is solely based upon the individual or particular factors about a given patient and their disease. Lung cancer provides fertile ground to explore quality cancer care in Ontario, not least of which because it's one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers, but it's also a substantial cause of cancer-related death. Stage three in particular is responsible for shortening the lives of our patients. It's a heterogeneous disease with a spectrum of anatomic extent, patient health status, and treatment approaches. And those treatment approaches usually entail some combination of thoracic surgery, cytotoxic chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and immunotherapy as part of a curative or palliative approach. Within the health services literature, expertise at presenting cancer center, access to multidisciplinary care, and neighborhood of residents have all been associated with treatment received in non-small cell lung cancer of some form or another. However, we especially lack this data in the stage three setting, and this is where our research makes an important contribution. And so within Ontario, are there modifiable healthcare system level factors associated firstly with the decision to offer any treatment at all? And secondly, in those selected for treatment, the decision to embark on palliative or curative treatment. Again, with optimal quality cancer care, no healthcare system level factors should be relevant to either of these decisions. Relevant system level factors could include things like the LIN within which a patient resides, which as we know are responsible for the coordination and funding of healthcare in the province, travel distance for cancer care, available expertise and experience at a given cancer center, and the waiting period before establishing the diagnosis. For the purposes of our research, these healthcare system factors, we defined um, in the following ways. So the LIN of residence, so the LIN that corresponded to a patient's primary residence. We consider this a system factor because if all patient and disease factors could be completely adjusted for, and there ended up being residual variation in the analysis, the effect at a LIN level must be system related. And it would be modifiable as a system factor because we have a single payer universal healthcare system for which uh, changes to policy and funding could be implemented at a LIN level. I would just note that for uh, due to privacy rules and regulations, this precludes us from publicly disclosing the results of this analysis by individual LIN. Um, and so these remain anonymized in our publication and in this presentation. In addition to LIN of residents, other health system level factors we identified included travel distance to the nearest cancer center. This included both the shortest driving distance as well as a geographic as the crow flies distance. The volume of treatment by treatment modality at the nearest cancer center. This was defined as the number of patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer treated with each applicable modality within a one year period. And we really use this as a proxy for cancer, several, cancer center level experience and expertise. The time interval between the first chest X-ray or CT scan on a given patient, um, which was assumed to be their first presentation, assuming it wasn't three months prior to the primary diagnosis, uh, we consider this the, um, the wait time or the diagnostic interval. And finally, treatment era, by which I mean the year that a patient was treated since we assume that patterns of practice, newer technologies, and new evidence and standards would be adopted over time. Of course, to isolate whether these variables would be related to the key uh, decisions that um, I've mentioned, and uh, we are controlling for or accounting for patient level and disease level factors. Um, and in our analysis, patient level variables included age, sex, area level income as a proxy for socioeconomic status, area level smoking rates as a proxy for individual smoking history, rurality of residents, and the, president, the, the presence of specific comorbidities, as well as the Ellickshauser comorbidity index. These were um, our best proxies for performance status. Disease level variables included histology and lobar location of the primary tumor, as well as uh, the substage category, including overall stage and the TNN categories. And then in those patients who had received treatment, additional variables which we considered disease level because of how these factors would be related to the underlying disease burden included things like the modalities of therapy received. So this would include systemic therapy, radiotherapy, and cancer surgery. And these were designated as either palliative or curative. 
And then we subtyped these modalities in the following ways. So for systemic therapy, there was cytotoxic chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and trial or other therapy. For radiotherapy, there was advanced radiotherapy or basic radiotherapy. So basic was really anything that wasn't advanced. And advanced was anything that, uh, any treatment that entailed IMRT, uh, VMAT, uh, stereotactic radiation, uh, at least five fields, um, or brachytherapy. And then for cancer surgery, we subtyped by thoracic tumor resection or metastasis surgery, the latter of which would only apply to those patients um, who, who eventually received this treatment, including if they were treated for cure and then eventually had metastatic progression. Other disease-related variables included the completion of an ESAS assessment. So this was really a proxy for the patient's underlying ability to complete it as possibly representative of their disease burden. Any utilization of acute healthcare resources within three months before or after the primary diagnosis, similarly a, a proxy for disease burden. Referral for any comprehensive assessment, so things like palliative care referrals, medical oncology, and geriatrics. And then finally, a receipt of a PET scan. We conducted this analysis for the time period before the COVID-19 pandemic, given that our data about treatment patterns would have obviously been significantly affected by this exogenous factor. So we selected up to 2018 for patient data inclusion, but looked no further back than 2010, since we assumed that there would have been too much change in practice patterns compared to now that would have limited the study's external validity. We excluded patients with a concurrent cancer diagnosis, as well as if they were less than 20 years of age, had a non-Ontario place of residence, or lacked public health insurance and coverage within uh, five years prior or two years uh, post-diagnosis. This was really just to limit patients with missing data, and if they were staged according to the AGCC 6th edition, which we regarded as sufficiently different from the 7th and 8th editions currently used that would limit the external validity of the analysis. Ultimately, Using multiple large administrative databases housed at ICES, including the Ontario Cancer Registry and others, we identified around 7,000 patients diagnosed with stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer in the province of Ontario between 2010 and 2018. We grouped those patients into those treated versus not treated, and then in those treated, we separated them according to their treatment intent, so whether curative or if they had only ever received palliative treatment. These groupings were meant to reflect our analysis of those key treatment decisions, again, to decide to treat at all, and if deciding to treat, whether for curative or palliative intent. So we'll get into the meat and potatoes. Looking at the uh, overall cohort, we can see that the median age is 70, uh, with most people male, urban living and with a diagnosis of COPD, and most people were stage 3A. Other characteristics not depicted here included that most patients will have their primary tumor at least in the upper lobe, and there is a slight preponderance of adenocarcinoma over squamous cell carcinoma. Not unsurprisingly, the median age in those that did not receive treatment is older than those who did. And there's a slight difference between those who received curative treatment and those who received palliative only treatment. No differences between sex were seen, were, were seen across groups. No difference of any meaningful magnitude in the proportion of patients in the lowest income quintile across groups. The proportion living in an urban residence was similar across treatment groups. There were large differences seen in the proportion of patients with a high comorbidity index. So this was a score of three or greater, both for, rece for not receiving treatment and for palliative only treatment. There was a greater proportion of patients with a diagnosis of COPD who did not receive treatment or receive palliative only treatment. Similarly with CHF, not receiving treatment and receiving palliative only treatment were overrepresented. A diagnosis of dementia was seen in a higher proportion of patients who did not receive treatment and slightly higher in the palliative only treatment cohort compared to curative treatment. And finally, a very large difference in the receipt of palliative only versus curative treatment with a diagnosis of stage 3B or 3C. This probably reflects the challenges in encompassing all disease within a safe radiotherapy portal. These patients almost invariably never receive curative thoracic surgery. 
And of note, in the no treatment group, the proportion you can see around 30% does not appear all that different from the curative treatment group. But it's important to note that stage 3B and 3C is compared to stage 3A as well as stage 3 unclassified. So it's likely the case that a good proportion of those patients who did not receive treatment didn't have any further substage um, designation into A, B, or C. So in summary, the characteristics of patients with stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer diagnosed in Ontario between 2010 and 2018 reveals that there's a higher age, higher comorbidity burden, a diagnosis of COPD, CHF, or dementia, and having a higher stage in those not receiving treatment, or if receiving treatment, in those receiving palliative-only treatment. As it relates to disease factors, about 60% of patients underwent PET scanning, about 30% received a palliative care referral, less than 50% were consulted to a medical oncologist, and most completed at least one ESAS, and utilization of acute healthcare services was infrequent, uh, and if accessed at all, it was usually just an eMERGE visit. Receipt of PET scan varied widely between groups, so in patients not receiving any treatment, uh, about a third of them did get a PET scan. And I would say it's hard to know what we should expect that number to be. The proportion of these patients will probably be too unwell for completion of staging to begin with. And the number of patients actually getting a PET scan and then not receiving treatment could mean that they died before they could receive any oncologic treatment or the PET scan informed the patient and treating team that best supportive care was in their best interest. When it comes to comprehensive assessments, patients not receiving treatment or receiving palliative only treatment were more likely to have had a palliative care consultation. And the number is only about 10% receiving a palliative care consultation for curative patients. And this number uh, probably should be higher. We have analyses done by some familiar faces locally that these patients with lung cancer benefit from early palliative care, especially these patients with more locally advanced disease for which we'd expect a larger symptom burden. Interestingly, I would say only about 50% of patients getting curative treatment were consulted to medical oncology, uh, which seems exceedingly low. And not unsurprisingly, only about 25% of patients who did not receive treatment completed an ESAS and there were similar rates between curative and palliative only treatment, which is to say, if you are, uh, if you begin treatment, then you're likely to complete at least one ESAS. Acute healthcare utilization around the time of diagnosis, again, was not common, but the trends we see here are not all that surprising. So favoring no treatment or palliative only treatment. When it comes to the details of the treatment that patients um, received, those who received palliative-only treatment typically did not receive chemotherapy. As for radiotherapy, it's reassuring, uh, at least to me, that the vast majority of patients treated either for cure or palliation received this treatment modality at some point. And so it's important to note that this number in the curative treatment group uh, there at 84.5%, that's not a reflection of whether patients received radiotherapy as part of their curative treatment. It just means that in those treated for cure, over 80% of them will be treated with radiotherapy at some point, either as their curative treatment or for palliation in the future. Around a third of patients underwent thoracic surgery at some point in their curative journey, and about three quarters of patients treated for cure with thoracic surgery also received adjuvant chemotherapy. About 50% of patients in Ontario were treated with concurrent chemoradiation as their curative modality. In terms of types of radiotherapy, a reminder that advanced refers to fiber more fields, IMRT, VMAT, uh, or stereotactic, uh, or brachytherapy, and then basic is anything other than advanced. Obviously, large differences are, are seen here between palliative only treatment, um, uh, as uh, between palliative only treatment and curative treatment in terms of the proportion of patients who receive basic radiotherapy as the technique of choice. And then amongst those treated um, with advanced radiotherapy techniques, um, BMAT was the selected technique about 30% of the time, and this was similar between curative and palliative-only treatment groups. We don't see large obvious differences here in the median shortest driving distance across treatment groups, and this was reassuring to me as someone uh, who hypothesized this very factor might play a role in treatment decision-making. 
And by treatment era, um, we see that the proportion of patients who did not receive treatment uh, decreased over time, uh, and the proportion of patients receiving curative treatment increased over time with each succeeding treatment era. This trend really prompted us to wonder whether a possible explanation might be that changing treatment techniques that are more tolerable for patients, such as increasing use of, of VMAT or better tolerated systemic therapies, is leading to an increase in the number of patients qualifying for treatment of any kind, and then for curative intent treatment in particular. So here we graphically represent the different types of treatment by treatment era. And you can see here that with each succeeding treatment era, we have an increase in the use of advanced radiotherapy over time. And similarly, we see increasing use of immunotherapy over time, which makes sense given when immunotherapy was adopted as a standard part of treatment uh, in the curative chemo radiation setting um, or as part of treatment for metastatic disease at the time of future progression in these patients at high risk for metastasis. What I would do is encourage all of you to keep this data in your mind since I'll be coming back to this a bit later when I talk about our multivariable analyses. So, to summarize, with the characteristics of patients diagnosed with stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer in Ontario between 2010 and 2018 in mind, um, I'll now turn to discuss our analysis of which of these patient disease and health system factors were ultimately associated with those key treatment decisions. So again, to offer any treatment at all, and if having been offered treatment, what was the ultimate intent of that treatment? We used a stepwise adjusted multivariable analysis using Poisson regression. For the any treatment versus no treatment decision, factors in the final adjusted model uh, included age, comorbidity index, diagnosis of dementia, receipt of a palliative care, geriatric or medical oncology consultation, completion of an ESAS, receipt of a PET scan, and histology in an anatomic location, the latter of which are likely related to how the data was coded as not otherwise specified for the reference variable. So in other words, no healthcare system level factors appear to be associated with the decision to offer any treatment. With advancing age, higher comorbidity index and a diagnosis of dementia, patients were more likely to have not received treatment and the effect sizes are largest at the highest ages and at the higher comorbidity scores. And a diagnosis of dementia had a large effect, so the risk ratio is 0 0.79. And having, gone, having undergone a palliative care or geriatric consultation was associated with no treatment, whereas having undergone a medical oncology consultation is associated with receipt of any treatment. And so that would be why the displayed relative risk range crosses one for the comprehensive assessments factor. PET scan and completing an ESAS were also associated with treatment of any kind, whether for palliative or curative intent, and there are large relative risks, so over 1.25. So reassuringly, again, no healthcare system level factors were associated with the uh, any treatment versus no treatment, which is to say to initiate treatment at all appears exclusively based upon individual factors about a given patient uh, and their disease. However, the same cannot be said about our adjusted multivariable analysis of treated patients when it comes to the actual decision about their treatment intent. So having received palliative only versus curative treatment was associated with key healthcare system level variables, which I'll go into, in addition to similar patient and disease related variables to the any treatment versus no treat com treatment comparison I just mentioned. So specifically, the factors in the final adjusted model included age, area level smoking rates, a diagnosis of COPD or CHF, receipt of a PET scan, uh, receipt of palliative care consultation, completion of an ESAS, an eMERGE visit, LIN of residence, diagnostic interval, uh, weight, uh, which is essentially the wait time, uh, cancer center treatment volume of systemic therapy per 100 people, uh, and again, histology and overall stage, the latter of which are likely, once again, related to an underlying coding standard. So as can be seen here, there are a range of relative risks based on the relevant factor. So some of these favor palliative treatment, 
others favor curative treatment, and then some have subcategories within them that favored one or the other, uh, hence the crossing of one here. So for instance, advancing age has a large relative, uh, large range of relative risks, all of which favored palliative intent with increasing age. In addition to age, zooming in a bit more closely, the other factors that favored palliative treatment included an area level smoking rate, diagnosis of COPD and CHF, receipt of a palliative care assessment, and this had a large magnitude of, of, of risk ratio. It was 1.81, so it's all the way over there at the, at the tail end. Having uh, an eMERGE visit and LIN of residence, which as you can see, had a very wide variability in uh, relative risk by, uh, on a LIN by LIN basis. On the other hand, uh, receipt of a PET scan, completion of an ESAS, and systemic therapy treatment volume were associated with curative treatment, and to a very small degree wait time with a risk ratio of 0 0.99. Uh, and a few of those LINs uh, favored curative treatment compared to the reference LIN. Therefore, uh, unlike the prior analysis regarding the decision to offer any treatment, there are key healthcare system factors which are associated with the intent of treatment that a patient receives in stage three non-small cell lung cancer in Ontario. Uh, and in particular, the fact that LIN of residence was, was associated with whether patients received palliative only or curative treatment, uh, it's really the key finding of our analysis. And this is where I'll turn to now to elaborate further. So zooming into the LIN by LIN analysis, in comparison to the reference LIN, LIN A, we can see a range of risk ratios of receiving palliative only treatment from 0 0.88 to 1.67 which is to say that in some LINs, there's an over 50% relative difference in the propensity for offering treatment intent after controlling for relevant patient and disease factors. So I've sorted them here by whether the LIN was more or less likely than the reference LIN to offer palliative treatment. So LINs B and J were the only two with relative risks that favored more patients treated for cure. And I would just draw your attention here to LIN B with a risk ratio of 0 0.88, LIN D with a risk ratio of 1.67, uh, LIN L with a risk ratio of 1.37, and E and N with a risk ratio of 1.35. Here, what I'm doing is just illustrating the magnitude of variability. This association between curative or palliative treatment intent by LIN is seen in an analysis that included six, 16 potential covariates. And while some differences can be expected at the margins, these findings um, require an explanation and further examination. Now, if you'll recall a few slides back, I demonstrated an increasing uptake of advanced radiotherapy and immunotherapy over time. So in theory, we might expect this, this to lead to changes in treatment patterns that might be driving that increase in the proportion of patients being treated at all, and in particular uh, for curative treatment. So in turn, we might expect that these LIN variations that I've just described in propensity for treatment intent should narrow over time as well. Unfortunately, this did not come to pass. So to test this hypothesis, we performed a stratified analysis by treatment era. So highlighted in the far left is the adjusted unstratified analysis that I just described. And the boxes highlight those LINs with at least a 20% relative difference from the reference LIN in propensity for offering palliative or curative treatment. And as can be seen here, uh, there remain similar relative differences by LIN within each of the three treatment eras, signifying that treatment era as a proxy for changing treatment patterns over time with increased uses of more advanced radiotherapy techniques that's more tolerable for patients and increased use of immunotherapy. This seems to have not minimized the magnitude or the frequency of LIN effects on the propensity for palliative curative treatment. The reasons why you can be confident about this conclusion I've shared with you is that our analysis was conducted with data obtained from a large, robust population data set from which we comprehensively included relevant covariates of interest. Our findings are also consistent with in the broader health services literature, 
that modifiable healthcare system level factors are associated with treatment intent. On the other hand, reasons to be skeptical of our conclusion would be that there are inherent limitations in retrospective study designs in terms of residual confounding. Important covariables to capture, like the patient's actual per performance status, is not perfectly accounted for in our data, but relevant proxies were incorporated that should capture this at least in part, such as comorbidity index, acute healthcare utilization, the presence or absence of certain comorbidities, et cetera. Finally, our key health system variable, which is the LIN of residence, may not actually be where the patient was ultimately treated, though we would expect that the vast majority would be treated in the LIN in which they reside. The important question I imagine on everyone's mind now is, of course, what is the cause of these differences? And I wish I could give you that silver bullet, but today I'm simply the herald for that issue. Possible explanations we might consider might be that there is variability in opinion amongst treating physicians about the benefits of curative treatment in this cohort, whom we already know generally have a poor prognosis. Or perhaps there are patient preferences that differ systematically across regions, such as due to cultural differences or otherwise. And I'm hoping that in the discussion portion of Rain Rounds this morning, other I others may have ideas about what's driving this magnitude of regional variability. Some possible ways to determine the causes of these differences in propensity for curative treatment ac across LINs could include uh, hosting structured discussions with thought leaders or local opinion leaders at each center, uh, circulating surveys about practice patterns to various cancer centers, or uh, possibly circulating across cancer centers structured case simulations with key patient factors where decisions might vary, such as performance status, age, presence of certain comorbidities, PFT values, uh, to identify trends in where and how clinical decisions diverge across limbs. Now, of course, while a good solution does require us to understand the cause so as to not leave us without anything to ponder, there is some literature available on possible effective practice change strategies. So there are, in fact, a few uh, systematic reviews, uh, including Cochrane reviews of published literature, which in some instances did actually include randomized trials. But they find that while there are various practice change methods which are effective, there's a wide range of efficacy in producing behavior change. And there's a limited understanding of the durability. Sorry, there is an, a limited understanding of the durability of these practice change patterns over time and low quality evidence of their effect on valuable patient outcomes like overall survival, quality of life, and adverse events. Bora and colleagues in a systematic review in BMC concluded that strategies such as educational meetings combined with printed materials, use of local opinion leaders as practice change champions, and systematic audit and feedback mechanisms may lead to improved adherence to clinical practice guidelines but little to no effect on oncologic outcomes. A Cochrane review by Arditi and colleagues of 35 mostly randomized studies found that the use of a system of computer-generated reminders but delivered on paper led to changes in specific metrics of quality care, such as test ordering rates, prescription rates, and compliance rates with certain standards, but either no effect or a low certainty of effect on patient-related outcomes such as mortality or adverse events. Finally, a systematic review by Tomasoni and colleagues of 35 of 33 studies in the oncology context specifically found that provider feedback on guideline compliance, group or organizational level educational strategies, or dedicated implementation teams does lead to changes in provider behavior pre and post intervention. However, this particular review did not report any downstream effects on specific patient outcomes such as survival quality of life, or adverse events. Other possible remedies could uh, include increasing emphasis on collaborating in communities of practice across LINs, centralizing or regionalizing peer review processes, especially in borderline cases, implementing more frequent and standardized processes for deciding treatment in a multidisciplinary fashion, development of practice guidelines at the provincial level to aid decision-making in these challenging stage three patients, and increasing knowledge translation across the province on the risks and benefits of curative treatment. So in the end, 
I hope this morning that I've convinced you that there exists across LINs in Ontario, large variations in the propensity for offering curative intent treatment for patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, and that these variations are not solely explained by patient and disease specific factors, which one might consider typical or expected, such as age, comorbidity, or others. And the concerns we should have about these variations relate both to the phenomenon of undertreatment, such that patients at some centers may not have had the opportunity to benefit from curative treatment, but also the phenomenon of overtreatment, such that patients may be selected for an aggressive treatment for which they may derive little benefit, uh, little if any benefit, or may only suffer harm. And with that, that brings me to my references. And I'm done early, but that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Look forward to any discussion or questions or comments. Dr. Robinson? Yes. start off with this by saying uh, thank you. That was a tremendously interesting, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. So uh, lots to explore, but we'll certainly have to make sure you can attend it. You forgot to stop. There. This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it seems like being Yeah, uh, a really great question uh, to which I do not have an answer. Um, one of the some of the the system variables we looked at were uh, like patient vol uh, um, cancer center volume. Um, so if there was a change in practice, you know, uh, you might expect a trend in increasing the number of patients treated, unless you're saying if one is replaced versus, or do you mean a new one is added? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Cool. At a LIN level, probably not, because this isn't at a cancer center level. Um, it's at a LIN level, so I suspect, um, I suspect not, but um, yeah, it's a good question. Dr. Robinson had a question. So that was great. Thank you. Um, I think we did practice in different locations. We realize in different cultures, and for some people, they live long, so we don't see it a lot. People live for as long. Do that, but I guess let's look at this tool to try to understand what this numbers um, because it seems like the limits many ways the doctors with even more pressure point now are probably not the seems like and some of them are a lot of them less than all of them. Does that suggest that there's not all the Well, I guess the um, maybe I'd ask 
the question back, how much variance in practice would you expect? So, you know, the magnitude of difference here is, as you mentioned, you know, could be 30%, could be 50%. Those numbers are similar in magnitude over time. And so I guess what you'd have to believe is that this is what is reflected in, you know, different uh, cultures, different approaches at a, at, at a Lynn level or, or cancer center level. And I just don't know if that would be a, um, uh, a, a safe conclusion to arrive at given the magnitude of differences. So it might be reasonable to explore. And if these are ultimately differences in culture, you know, is that something that is modifiable? You know, there is some literature that says we can modify and increase the, um, you know, the adherence to clinical practice guidelines, you know, given some of the systematic reviews I talked about. So yeah, is there any evidence that any of these were inconsistent with guidelines? Yeah, no, I guess, no, yeah, I don't, I, I couldn't say, I couldn't say at an individual level, no. But if that, if there is, yeah, so I guess, the, I guess the, the, the question remains, if, would we expect this magnitude of difference? Um, and I think magnitudes of difference would be present given, um, as you mentioned, you know, maybe weight loss matters for some versus others, but would those differences be so systematically different that at a Lynn level, when we've tried to account for some of these other, you know, variables that, that, you know, isn't captured and, you know, it presumably would minimize the, uh, the Lynn specific, um, magnitude of effect. So uh, that, that's really what, what I would say. It, because we don't know the cause, I can't I can't say any anything with confidence. But my intuition or my hypothesis would be that this magnitude of benefit requires at least some exploration, um, and and I wouldn't have expected this level of difference if it was just a um, you know a difference on the margins between some staff or some centers versus others. So you have a difference, and then feed on. Is that feed on? Really? Yes. Yeah. So there's really no significant. Key values for difference, at least in the 2016 to 18, but in adjusted analysis, there's still a couple of other problems. So, might be instant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, I, I, my, we know how we can change changes into clocks and numbers, right? So, there's just more clocks and clocks. This is a clocks and numbers. Yeah. Do you have um, a sense as the center? I guess is the other question because we can't tell if this is like what's what's correct. I mean, we're assuming it's mm. the same. So you know, it's you know, more theory than treatment could be over treatment as well. You know, just you know, more time it could be under treatment. But do you have any sense of uh, of these for survival if some patterns explain? Explained by systemic differences, potentially uh, committed with the other option of the nature. Yeah. Do you have any sense of that? No. Yeah. So um, I don't, but um, I guess the, the um, yeah. So what I would say is that I don't. I don't have a sense of whether, you know, whether this matters. I think if you were to tell a patient that the likelihood of you receiving a particular treatment matters where you are treated. Um, you know, it's just on its face, something that would be of concern. And I, the work you'd have to do to tell them, and it actually doesn't matter whether you receive this aggressive treatment or whether you are treated only for palliation. Um, again, that's a hypothesis, that's an assumption. So it, it would need to be tested. Um, and so I think the main uh, um utility or benefit of the research we've done is that if we were to explore this further and we see that there isn't large, you know, differences in survival or or whatever, that most of these decisions are made on the basis of, you know, appropriate um, patient-specific factors that we don't account for, um, then I, I guess it's it would be less of an issue. But I think those are assumptions that we should make after we've explored it. Um, because again, these are differences that are of such magnitude that um, to assume that this is a you know a reasonable disagreement between 
uh, centers or have does not have an impact, um, we should probably test that hypothesis first before before concluding confidently. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Where you should see the huge differences. Yeah. There wasn't this many questions. There, there wasn't this many questions last week, so I don't know what to make of this. Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you so much. No worries. Can you do your analysis on the completion goal of whether curative treatment was offered and the patient decided on treatment? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wonder if some of that point has seen some reference to that in the where curative treatment's been offered, are they based on their age, their comorbidities, and the distance to travel for the number of treatments? So I just wondered if you're yeah. No, it's a it's a it's a really great question. And what I would say is that some of those factors that you pulled out there about age, comorbidity, travel distance, I totally agree with you. It was one of the reasons why I had my hypothesis in the first place, which was that travel distance seems like something that a lot of patients would talk about, especially when you're in the you know chemo radiation setting, three weeks of treatment versus you know two weeks or two and a half weeks. Um, it can be a big difference. So but what we see is that assist, so using um, population level data, we don't see, we see differences by by age and comorbidity, but even when those differences are accounted for, we see LIN level differences. So there must be something else driving it. And so um, maybe it is patient preferences that they are, we don't have data on whether they were offered and, and declined it. Um, but I think that that would be, a, that's a, a, a another question to, to answer is, you know, are these differences not explained at a provider level, right? The, the the centers have some small variability in their propensity for curative or palliative treatment from a provider perspective, um, but they're offering that treatment within a culture or within a, a context of patients who um, have some of these barriers or, or other things that they would consider, you know, not, you know, as reasons why they might not want curative treatment or palliative treatment. So we don't have enough of that granularity, but um, I totally agree. Like it's something to to explore and that could be some difference might be driven by that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which again, travel distance didn't have much of an impact here, right? Like the median, the median distance, uh, you know, across groups was very similar. Um, and it wasn't included in any of the adjusted models. So, um, you know, there, there must be some proportion of patients who are willing to travel and are and perhaps that means that at some centers, we are good at accommodating those patients who, you know, want to receive aggressive treatment, but can't travel, right? Maybe we do a good job of that better than we think. Um, but but yeah, there's there's definitely some um, some unexplained variation that could be uh, because of patient preferences that differ systematically across across regions. Because you would what I would say is you'd expect some differences amongst patients. Um, so the question would have to be that some centers just have a wide uh, have some for cultural reasons or whatever have a big difference between between them to justify you know this magnitude of difference. Yeah, I'm sure there's wealth of that there that can lead to further analysis, uh, which, you know, I may have tons of questions about so many things, but I'll limit to one question and one comment. So my question is, do you think the rate of adoption of clinical trials in any of those plans has factored in? I can't imagine it would be a huge number to begin with, but even with that, uh, does that have an impact on how some then, you know, uh, treat some patients uh, in a certain way than others? I would like to look into that. But my comment is uh, we've seen over the years community of practice, as you mentioned, make a huge difference in consistency and adoption of guidelines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know for sure that in some of these side groups, it has actually transformed how things are done. So I'm not sure if you have any data about, you know, uh, like are there published protocols in certain, you know, these sites or centers that have factored into that. Maybe not, but I think it's worked for the future. Yeah, I think I, th I would just say I, I agree. I think it's I think it's worked for the for the future. We 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 yeah we don't know. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Greg. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, so I, I think the, the the main takeaway isn't necessarily the specific numbers. I, I I agree. It's really the magnitude of difference. So so I so I think the to be honest, with you, yeah, the the choice of reference I think um, you know obviously would change the numbers, but it wouldn't change the magnitude. So that would be that's the key takeaway of our of our of our analysis is that there's a a large difference amongst lens, and even if you were to change the reference lens, you might see these numbers change, you might see more offering palliative versus curative, but those differences of of, uh, of a, what I would call a concerning magnitude or a, a magnitude needing exploration um, would be would be similar or the same, I would expect, unless I'm not statistically sound with that conclusion, but yeah. I'm just curious, um, when the winds that are close together, do they have similar differences mm. over uh that's a, yeah that's a um a good question the trend is certainly that the reference lens is offering more curative treatment than most other lens um so yeah that's a, a fair point i don't know if there, we, we didn't look at it sort of as clustering the lens and saying, you know, is there a similar trend? And then looking at a cluster comparing to a different cluster, we didn't do that, but it's a, it's a fair, um, fair comment. No more, please. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, for privacy reasons that you know, I could I could not disclose even if I had. Yeah, that's awesome. Doctor Hand, actually, I, he just I was just didn't want to miss Doctor Hand. Okay, comment that you were so worried this and that it could also be a tendency. So I think. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you want to take your microphone's online. Is there anything in the chat box? Perfect. Big congratulations. Uh, thank you again. Uh, it's been an honor and privilege to have you in the corner. We wish you the absolute best. This is St. Marie. Uh, lucky to have you. Uh, it's, uh, it's so, good round of applause. Thanks, Martin.